Okie dokie, yeah. So last chance. Any 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 questions before we get going today? Yes. Of course. Everything, technically anything up to, but excluding the day of the test could be on the test. Yeah. Yeah. The focus. <laughs> Yeah, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. I think that's what I said. Can others confirm that? Okay, good. Yeah. Other questions? All right. So this is where we left off. Remove. Removing from uh, the indexed bag. There's the two removes. One takes an index, and it goes to that index and removes the thing. Right? All it is, assuming it's not out of bounds, you get the thing out of the index. You shift left to close that gap. That's what that shift left was. It was that private method. We decrease the count and then return the element. And the other remove. Well, that's if you don't specify an element, but you sp like the index of an element, but you specify a specific element you want to remove. In that case, uh, we could have done this a bunch of ways, but we actually just kind of do it by hijacking the other index. And the way we do that is, well, first of all, if it's not there, return false. It's not succeeding. Otherwise, you get the index of the element, with some method that we haven't looked at yet, but I'm guessing you can envision what classic algorithm is index of going to do? A linear search, obviously. So we search for the element, we return the index of that element, assuming it exists, this won't be negative one. Um, and then we remove the thing at that index, and the way we do that is just by calling the other remove. So the remove where you specify the index, it goes to that index and you remove it. The remove where you specify the element is, well, you find the index of that element, and then you remove it based on the index. Easy peasy, right? You could do it without calling the other one. You could do it however you want, whatever. But that's how I decided to do it. I thought it was a little nicer. Someone last time, I think it was you, was it you that pointed out what happens if it's an integer? Yeah? Right? So what happens if the generic type is integer? And you say, remove five. Job is going to go like, well, hold on. Do you, do you want to remove from the index five, or did you want to remove the element five? Uh-oh. And yes, in that case, you can have a, a bit ambiguity, but you can, clear, like, you can clean that up by specifying that it's an integer five. You can create an integer, not an int, and you'll be good to go. Another thing you may have noticed is the top remove removes and returns something of type t. But the second remove returns a Boolean. So first and foremost, there's no hard rule about what it should be returning. But to me, well, following the basic Java collections, your most, your most general remove always returns a Boolean. True, false, indicating the success. But in my mind, the remove where you specify, like with the, with, with the second remove, if I'm specifying an element, I probably, I mean, maybe I do, but I'm thinking I probably don't really care to get a reference to the element that I already know I want to remove. If I say remove the string hello, if I have reference, imagine I have a country catalog, right? Think back to assignment one. If I have reference to a country and I say, remove this country, what value am I getting back by the remove returning a reference to the country that was just removed? I already have a reference to that country because I gave it to the method to remove in the first place. I don't deny that there might be a valuable case on that, but I'm, I'm having a hard time seeing it. So in that case, I'll just return the Boolean, the success. Now, if I'm specifying the specific index, well, maybe I actually really do want the thing at that index to come back. So I'll return the thing at that index. That was the method to my madness on that, if you're wondering why. At the end of the day, 
It is ultimately kind of arbitrary, but I think this is a good design. But if you're like, no, I, I hate that, fine. Deal with it. Uh, da -da. Cool. Any, any questions about the array indexed bag? Obviously, we did not look at all of the methods in that class. You can go download the array index bag. Array index bag class. Oh, this is probably supposed to say array sorted bag, but. And funny, it actually is the array sorted bag. Uh, download, anyways. See if I can open it up. Because I remember last time it wasn't letting me. All right, well, if I could open it, we could in look at all of the methods. It's a complete class, but I only showed you a, a few. Yeah. These are the ones I wanted to hit, because all the other ones you should be reasonably familiar with in one way or another already. Cool? Yeah. Now, the same is going to go for the array sorted bag. I'm not going to include all of the methods in these course notes. You can go download the class and look at it all yourself, which I strongly encourage you to do. But for the time being, I'm only going to focus on some of the key things that are going to be the most different from what we've seen before. The things I don't show you, they're more or less the same as something we've done already. So. In addition to all the bag methods, we also need to include remove first, remove last, first, and last. And of course, the remove has to be done the, the right way. And same with the add, needs to be done the right way. And when I say right way, I mean inserting the thing into the collection such that it's sorted. Removing the thing from the collection such that it remains sorted. Like, remember how Way back at the beginning of the semester, I, I showed an example of, like, I think it was the contact list example. I might, I might be mixing them up. But I think with the contact list example, I said, well, when we remove, I create a gap, right? If I've got a bunch of things and I remove something from some arbitrary position, I'm probably going to create a bit of a gap in my data. Right, I'm going to have an empty index. That index doesn't really matter anymore. And remember what we did, where instead of shuffling everything down one, which is linear time, do you remember what we did? Yeah, you, we moved the thing from the end and just put it there. So it was always constant time, which was awesome. But that only worked because the order of the elements in that collection that we looked at then didn't really matter to me. They weren't sorted, the order didn't matter, whatever. But with the array index bag and sorted bag, the order matters, right? In the index bag, each element is in its index. And they should stay in their indices, assuming I haven't removed the specific element, Removing A shouldn't change where D is, except for like moving up or down one index. It shouldn't be jumping around the collection. Order matters. We need to preserve the order. So that's why we had to do a linear time uh, shift left and shift right to make room and close the gap. So we didn't just take the thing from the end and put it in the middle. But do you remember doing that at the beginning of the semester? That only was, we could only take advantage of that because the state of our data's order didn't matter. Here, it does. So we couldn't do that, if you were wondering. So now, array sorted bag. So the first line has a lot to parse. Public class array sorted bag, its generic type T must extend it comparable, which is generic of some question mark, super T, what? And then finally implement sorted bag. All right, well, what the hell does this actually mean? I already kind of told you, but I'm, I'm going to summarize it again. 
array sorted bag t extends comparable. That means the elements that we want to put into a sorted bag must be sortable. They must have some defined ordering. So the generic type t extends comparable. Extends, you remember, is inheritance. If we're inheriting from the comparable class, there's only like one method in the comparable class we care about called compare to. So if we have a class, it's a generic one, and it extends comparable, that means it must have a compare to method written for it. And the compare to is where we define what comes before, what comes after, and what's equal to each other for that type. So the generic type must have a compare to written, which is how the order is defined. That's what that's ultimately saying. What do we have? We have a default capacity, not found constant, bag, and rear. I believe it's the exact same fields that we had in the indexed bag. Yeah. <coughs> and then we have two constructors. It's the same as always, right? Create a new thing with the specified capacity, cast it to the proper type. But you'll notice here, actually, it's not object. This, this is actually a little different. Remember before we always made an array of objects? And then we casted it to type T. Well, here, because we were a little, we put a bit of a restriction on our generic type, right? We said the generic type, it can't be any arbitrary object. It has to be at least comparable. So we create an array of comparable things that we immediately cast to type T, FYI. This type of question, like, it's not on the test, right? Don't worry, I would totally forget it, and then the IDE would yell at me saying, like, hey, I can't guarantee it's comparable if it's just ob, right? So we made it comparable. So just FYI, that's why, but you, no one would blame you if you forgot that, but fortunately, IntelliJ these days is pretty clever enough to be like, yeah, that should be comparable, not objects. Otherwise, the other constructor just passes it the default capacity. Any questions up until this point? The only thing new is this whole comparable restriction, which is right here and uh, has implications for the array type that we make. So I'm going to break down the comparable thing a little bit. And I'm just going to like basically read this part. So notice t extends comparable, question mark super t. What the hell does all this mean? Well, there's actually quite a bit to unpack here, but at the end of the day, what I said it was, the elements have to have some order defined for them is effectively all that really matters. But there is a little bit of nuance to it we can go into. First, when something extends comparable, it means that that type, that the Generic type T, the type of the elements we want to put into the sorted bag, they must have an ordering defined for them. And the method compared to is implemented for this type. If we were to go to the class of the type that we want to put into our sorted bag, we would find a compare to method. Maybe, but that all depends on inheritance and we'll get there in a moment. If you wanted to put your country objects into a, an array sorted bag, you can't. Because you didn't write the compare to method. And you didn't extend comparable. You could, you could go back to your country objects, extend comparable, implement the compare to, to define the ordering, and then it's fine. But it has to be comparable. Otherwise, we can't add it to a sorted bag because, well, what the hell does it mean to sort something that's not sortable? So if I were to say x dot compare to y, this is how compare to always works. And I'm going to warn you, I always, for some weird reason, you ever like get something wrong once and then forever you're always left going like, wait, oh, 
shit, which way, how do, do you ever kind of like mix something up once and then you always get it wrong because you're always like second guessing yourself? That happened to me once and I always get this wrong. I'm pretty sure it's right here. But if you get it wrong, you're like me. X compared to Y. It'll return a negative, and the weird part is, is to me, the way it actually works is rather intuitive with the syntax, and yet I still get it wrong. When I say x compared to y, I'm asking x, where are you relative to y? If compared to returns a negative integer, that means x comes before y. If it gives you a 0, it means they are equal. And if it gives you a positive number, it means x is bigger than y. That's what it would mean. So you would have to write code. If you wanted to make your country class comparable, and you're writing a compare to, you would have to have some logic in that code that says, well, if I want something to come before something, compare to should return a negative 1 or a negative whatever. If they're equal, it should be 0. And if I want the, the x to come after y, I want it to be a positive number. So that's the idea behind compare to. So when something extends comparable t, that means this can be compared to some type t. This can be compared to things of type t, but not the other way around. t extends comparable means that the type t can be compared to things of type t to provide some defined ordering which is needed if the elements are to be sorted. And then finally, when we have that extra question mark and whatnot in there, t extends comparable question mark super t means that t can be compared to something of type t or a superclass of type t. Remember superclass, meaning uh, something above it, right? So like, imagine like an integer versus like a more general number, right? Maybe a a general number has a compare to written for it, and then the integer has, I'm not saying this is how it works in Java, I'm just using an example. Maybe the number class had the compare to defined for it, and you go look at the integer class, there's no compare to in there, but it inherited it from its superclass. Long story short, there is a compare to for that class somewhere, <laughs> okay? That, I just, uh, there's a, there was a lot to unpack there, unpack, right? So thus, this means that T must have a defined ordering for itself through either a direct implementation of compare to or inheritance. There's a lot of nuance there. All it means is that the things we want to put in the sorted bag have some order defined for them somewhere. That's what it means. That's really what I want your takeaway to be. This is another example of, I'm not going to ask you this on the test. What's the code I write to make some, that's psychotic if I were to do that to you. I wouldn't memorize this. I look it up every time I need to do it. I'm like, does the question mark go on that side or that side? I can't remember. I, you know. Any questions about this? Yes. Yes. And if you don't, well, you probably don't really have an order for those things. So those things shouldn't have an order. So like, like alphabetical order, right? Yeah. So like if you're comparing country A and country B. Do you want to have them sorted by population? population? Yeah, actually, that would be or maybe population density, or maybe it all depends on what do you want. So when you are defining an order for the objects, remember, you're God. You are, you are saying this is the ordering, right? So if you're ever thinking, like there's a lot of times in programming where you're like, what's the right choice? Maybe there isn't an answer. It's you tell me what makes sense. For you. I could have worded the question that, that assignment in such a way where maybe the order matters based on population density, or maybe based on alphabetically by their name, or based on any other weird arbitrary ordering I could possibly imagine, right? You can do however you want. There's also things called like comparators, 
where you can start to add all of this interesting nuance to like, well, the order based on this, but if there's a tie, then we want it based on this. You can get crazy with how you want to order things. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is the question mark linked to the super, like is the wild card for the super class? No, it's, it means that, okay, hold on. <laughs> Let me make sure I got it right, because I hope I didn't get it backwards in this example. What does it look like up here? Because this would be what's actually, okay. So it means that, it means that we have some type T, and comparable must be implemented for something that's a superclass of type T. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> if I have it wrong, let me put it this way. If, if I worded that wrong, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> okay. Other questions? It's the magic code. Don't worry, you're going to do this for assignment four. You'll get it figured out. Actually, no, you're going to use a comparator for assignment four, which is even easier. Um, I think. I can't remember. It's been a while. All right. Adding elements. So, if we're out of room, we're going to do that expand capacity thing. Except we're not actually calling an expand capacity we wrote. We're going to use the arrays.copy of because it's a built in and we should do that anyways. Remember, the only reason we did the expand capacity the way we did it before was because we're learning how these things work. Well, there's a built-in method we could just use to make our lives a little easier. So arrays.copy of will do the trick. And regardless of if we needed to expand the capacity or not, we find the insertion index with some magic method called uh, find insert index that we'll look at shortly. And then we shift right to make room. You insert the thing at that index, increment rear, return true. So the logic should be fairly straightforward, right? Especially with how everything's kind of broken down in the methods. Find where it belongs, make room, add it, increment rear, return true. So now, all right, well, find where it belongs. How do you do that? Well, fortunately, it's effectively just going to be a linear search. There's a little bit more to it because you're comparing various elements here, but let's look at this code. <clears throat> Notice it's a private method because it's only going to be used inside this class. I don't want anyone to interface with this method. I'm creating an index, search index, and now, have we used these for loops before in this semester? No. No. Now this is called, this is what we call an enhanced for loop. It's a special for loop. This for loop is actually what you are used to in Python. All right? Remember how in Python it would be like for each thing in some collection of things? That's what a for loop was? Well, that's what this is. All right? The syntax is a little different, but now, what this says is for each thing, bag element is the thing. But we have to specify the type, and it's generic. So for each t bag element in some collection of things. Now this is a little funky, because <laughs> I actually don't know. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't have shown you this code yet. Maybe I threw you too much into the deep end. But this, what is this? It's a reference to itself, right? Now, I could have wrote this, oh God, I could have wrote what you are seeing here in a way, in, in a slightly different way, where I say for each, bag, for each bag element of type T colon the bag array, right? I could have done it like that, okay? But <laughs> this whole class is going to be iterable. And anything that is iterable, you can iterate over with an enhanced for loop. 
So this is a reference to itself, which is iterable. So this means iterate over this collection. Now, we all know, because we're looking at the code, that the collection, the container is the array. But this, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for this one today. <laughs> I'm going to, let me start over. This syntax, when you've never seen it before, especially without having the context of, of being familiar with iterators and iterable, this syntax is definitely weird, right? Trust me, it makes perfect sense, it, and it will eventually, just not today, probably. I'm going to warn you. Assuming it, it, yeah, assuming the collection is iterable, um, then it will work. But until it's iterable, this actually won't work. For the time being, this is, this is a for loop that has slightly different syntax than what you were used to seeing in Python, but it works the same way as Python. For each thing in the collection of things. Here, the thing I'm referring to by the variable name bag element, but I have to specify the type because it's Java and it's not Python. The colon, instead of writing in, we put a colon, right? And then on the right hand side, we specify the collection of things. Now, in our particular situation, the collection of things is itself because this class is a bag and a bag is iterable, or it will be. <laughs> Give me one second here. I might have an example. Yes, so I did show you this before at the very beginning of the semester, and then we never touched it since. So this is showing you the comparison in Python for C in a list, print C, right? And that would go A, B, C, D, right? In Java, assuming I have an array of characters, which is weird because you never really use the character primitive type, but I am here. For each character C, colon, an array, system.out.println C. They're the same. Now, where you're probably a little like, wait, but what? Because you didn't name, it's, you say this, and that's kind of weird. Yeah, I was getting fancy with my code. Just plug your nose, and I'm going to try to move past this, and we'll come back to it later. But is there any burning questions before? We pretend we didn't see what we just saw. Yeah. I could. I could have. Um, but this style actually is more general because, and I am going to get to this when we hit the iterators topic, which I believe is the next topic. But when you have something that's iterable, if you have an array, how do we iterate over the array typically? Well, we start at i is 0 and then 1, 2. We use like a regular old counting for loop, right? But we could use this fancy enhanced one too because arrays have iterators defined for them. But we would typically index with i. But if you had a link structure, you wouldn't do it that way. You can't. You can't ask a link structure, give me the thing at index 7. It's, no. You iterate over a link structure by doing like, well, current equals current dot get next. Current equals current dot get next, right? Like that's how we do it. We do it with a while loop typically. Well, now we have two entirely different syntax, sets of syntax for iterating over these collections. Wouldn't it be great if we had a, a common system for iterating over the collection regardless of the underlying container? Yes, it would be. And that's how we would do it. And we're going to see how once we do iterator very soon. Cool. All right, so for each thing in a collection of things, if element, the thing I want to add, dot compare to bag element, 
is less than or equal to 0, remember what I was saying. If this is a negative number, so, oops, if this gives me a negative number, that means element comes before bag element. If it's equal, they're the same. And if it's a bigger than 1, it means element must come after bag element. So if I conclude that the thing I want to insert should come before the current thing I'm looking at, where does it go? Before it or after it? Before it, right? Oh, OK, so I know it goes there. I just have to move everything down one and put it there, right? Yeah. Yes. And assuming they are truly equal, it shouldn't matter the order. But that is a good observation. So I'm going to re-say what he just said. If I've got a list, and the first thing in the list is a 0, and I want to insert a 0, this would say, oh, they're equal. And if they're equal, if, if this condition is less than or equal to 0, it's equal to 0, I'm, I want to insert at that index. Shouldn't I have inserted the thing I want to add, even though it's equal? Wouldn't it kind of make sense that, like, well, they're equal, but I added it later, so shouldn't it, like, come after the thing it's equal to? And, yeah, you could entirely do it that way, but to me, they're equal. I don't care which order the things that are equal are ordered. They're equal. Like, let me put it this way. Let's see if this, work, this won't work. If I have a list of the numbers 0, 1, 3, 7, 8, 8, 9, and I want to an add an 8 to this, the result would be, OK, 0, 1, 3, I don't know why I made so many numbers, 8, 8, 8, 9, right? That would be the result. Right? If I added an 8 to this sorted bag. And then you ask the question, well, where did you put the 8, though? Did you put it here, here, or here? Does it matter? I was just thinking like <laughs> if the objects were like, had, weren't like all identical, even if they had like the same sort of value to them. Mm. So it's, kind of, it's like ordered by age, but there's still like a first come, first serve situation, kind of like a priority queue for like assignment three. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. But at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter. And because if I was, the way I wrote it here is I would say, OK, eight. Eight, well, that gives me a positive number, positive number, positive number, positive number, zero. So I insert it here. I move all of this down. I could have gone well until it's not less than then. Oh, OK. Where, where I don't look for less than or equal to, I just look for less than. Clear on this, though? Cool. So if the thing I want to insert, and let's look at the example of, let's say I want to add a negative 1. Element is negative 1. The first time through the loop, bag element is going to be 0. Well, negative 1 compared to 0 will give me a negative number, meaning it should come before it. So I just need to move everything down one to make room in the array for the thing I want to add. Let's say I'm adding the number 4, right? 4 compared to 0, that gives me a positive number. 4 compared to 1, that gives me a positive number. 4 compared to 3, that gives me a positive number. Meaning, remember, when it's a positive number, that means 4 comes after 3. Compared to 7, that gives me a negative number. Oh, must come before 7. And I'm happy to conclude that it goes right here, because although I just concluded that 4 comes before 7, right before that, I concluded that it must come after 3. So it must come after 3, 
before 7. Cool? A lot of people, when they learn this, they're always concerned about comparing pairs. Does it go between these pairs? And that would work, but it's a little extra work. Yeah, yeah, there's more funny things going on. Really all that matters is you're always just comparing it to this one to know if it goes here and you need to make room. So that's how find insertion index works. Where we find where the element should come before the current thing I'm looking at, return that index. But notice, so first of all, because I'm using this loop, where I'm looking at the elements, I don't actually have, I never kept track of an index, like with a for loop, where i is the index. I needed another variable to keep track of the current index. So I did need that still. And at the end, if I ever finish the loop, if I'm adding the number 100, well, 100 compared to 7, and just pretend I got to here. Well, that's a positive number. 100 compared to 8, that's a positive number. 100 compared to 8, that's a positive number. 100 compared to 9, that's a positive number. I just now concluded that 100 doesn't go before the last thing. It must come after the last thing. Meaning, where should it go? After the last thing. So if I ever finish the loop, I return whatever the rear is. Because it must go at the end. Pardon? You could use this sorted bag to do insertion sort pretty damn easily, right? Just take your collection of things and throw them into a sorted bag. It's insertion sort, right? Any questions about this? This really is just the magic now. The whole magic of this sorted class, or sorry, this, this sorted bag is find where it goes and then add it there. If you were think like it's kind of funny, because I feel like when I remember learning this the first time, I remember thinking like, oh man, there's going to be so much extra logic, whatever. As soon as you break it down, when I say find where it goes, obviously that's not trivial. But we wrote a function to do that. Find where it goes, make room, add it there. That's it. Remove. Well, it's already sorted. All you have to do is eliminate the thing and close the gap, kind of like we did with the index bag. All right, so what do I say here? Uh, the add method makes use of a private method, find insert, find insert make class iterator method to iterate over the collection. It's, it is simple, simply used to perform a linear search. It also makes use of compare to. Remember, the elements themselves determine the ordering. I'm asking, I'm asking the element of type T. I'm not asking the sorted bag. I'm asking the thing of type T. How does it compare to the other thing of type T. Is that clear? Because element is of type T. Compare to is written for the class of type T. The sorted bag doesn't have the compare to. It's making use of the data's compare to. Uh, da -da. One does not know what the type T is, so how can they be compared? Well, if they're numbers, those will work. But if they're, if they're if, what if sorted strings are colors? I mean, whatever. So compare to needs to be written, since T must have compared to. Yada, yada, we already said it. There we go, cool. Any, any, any last questions about this uh, sorted bag? You might find this helpful for assignment three a little bit. I don't know. Now, I just talked about an array implementation. There's nothing stopping me from doing a linked implementation. In fact, maybe a linked implement implementation is even easier or better. I don't know. But I did an array implementation. Maybe we could do a, a, a linked implementation. Well, I'm not going to. But you will in the lab if you didn't already. So although not discussed here, a linked implementation could also be done. And what do I have here? And the trick to this is to make use of, remember, inserting in the middle, after, before, removing, middle, after, before. It's, that's the trick. That's the magic of getting this to work. 
On assignment three, do I say your priority queue needs to be a linked implementation or an array, or do I not specify? Uh, it's called linked priority queue. Okay, so I say make a linked one. All right. <laughs> I guess you already have written to your class. Written for you just to start? Yeah. Okay, cool. So any, any other questions? Oh, look, it looks like my, uh, it finally opened. <laughs> it may have been there a while, I don't know. But all the, long story short, like I was saying, all the code is here. Um, I just didn't show it to you. <laughs> oh, don't need this one. So, any last, last chance for any last questions about the bags? Because that's all I'm going to talk about for bags. Was that a hand or just a scratch? Just a scratch. So that means you're all really happy about bags. Yeah? Okay, good stuff. All right. Now, as promised, iterators. So it's often quite handy to be able to iterate over some thing. Assuming it makes sense to iterate over it. If I have some collection, it's usually pretty handy to be able to iterate over that collection. For example, like an array or a stack or a queue or a bag. Now, you might say, well, hold on, the stacks and queues, you really are only supposed to access the elements from, like, very specific, you have very strict rules about how you access the elements, right? The stack is always the top, and the queue, it's always the front or adding to the rear. But with iterators, it's a little bit different because the point of the iterator isn't so much to like really access the stuff. It's just to be able to have a nice convenient way to just like iterate over the collection. So for example, like think of the two string, right? When we did two string for our stacks, for example, we did have to iterate over the collection to do the two string, right? So we could still want to iterate, even though we're not really trying to access things from other parts of the, of the stack or the queue. Iterating is just a nice, convenient way to iterate over the collection. It's a great name, iterator for iterating. But an iterator is just this single purpose robot where it starts at the beginning of some collection, not even necessarily the beginning, but it starts somewhere, and it goes to the next thing, and then it goes to the next thing, and it goes to the next thing. An iterator is a class that we will write for a collection that says how to iterate for that collection. So the iterator itself is the tool we use to iterate over the collection. Like if I'm an iterator for that row of students, I would start here, and then I would go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. If you say, can you go back? No. Go to the next one, go to the next one. If you want to go back, you start over. It's a, it's a stupid, single purpose little class. But when a class is iterable, there's a difference, iterator and iterable. When a class is iterable, it means you can get an iterator for that class. And if you can get an iterator for that class, you can use enhanced for loops, which is nice. It's nice syntax. But we're going to start with iterators. <clears throat> so yeah, this is called iterating over things. And we've done this so many times already, right? Here's how we iterate over some array i equals zero, i less than some array dot length, i plus plus, some process on the array at i. And if we have a link structure, that's how we did it. Well, the current node is not null. Do the process on the data at that node and then set the node to be the next node. This is your like general way you iterate over these two types of things. <clears throat> So Java and a lot of other 
relatively modern programming languages, provide a nice uniform way to iterate over things with iterators. Iterators are objects that allow iterating over something one element at a time. Get each element in the array, get each element of a bag, get each element in a link structure, get each element in a stack, get each element in a string, whatever. Then there are two important relevant interfaces we care about. Iterator and iterable. Iterator is the object that does the iterating. Iterable makes the whole class have an iterator for it. So the iterator interface, iterator objects are typically remarkably simple. They define an iterator for a class, define the class such that it implements the iterator. Use the iterator interface. And if you click that, it'll actually take you to the Java docs for the iterator. And if you go there, there are two abstract methods we got to implement. Has next and next. The other ones we don't actually need, but has next and next are the two methods we care about. Next is a method that returns the next element. And has next is a method that um, will return true if there exists another element and false otherwise. That's it. And with these two things, we can make our iterators. So if I have an iterator for some class, I can get the iterator for that class, all right, assuming that this is implemented. We haven't looked at what the iterator looks like yet. But assuming I can get an iterator from the class, I could write code that like this. Iterator of type t, iterator, equals some arbitrary iterable thing. Maybe it's an array. Maybe it's a bag. Some, some class that has an iterator for it. I get its iterator with the method iterator. If, uh, if a class is iterable, it must have an iterator method that returns the iterator. More on that in a moment. But line one there, that's to get the iterator. And I can then say like, okay, well, there's something left to look at. Well, iterator has next is true. Get the next thing. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. Do it again. So if, if I'm the iterator, I would say, OK, is there something that exists? Yeah, get the next thing. And when I get the next thing, I, I return the next thing, but I also always like take a step. Does it have a thing? Yeah, next. Does it have a thing? Yeah, next. Yeah, next. Yeah, next. Yeah, next. No, done, because we got to the end. So this is the common way, we, this is one of the common ways we can iterate over some collection that has an iterator. Whether, nothing that you see here, when I say arbitrary iterable thing, you have no idea if it's got an array underneath, underneath it. You have no idea if it's a link structure. You have no idea what it is. But we know that it, we can get an iterator for it. And if we get an iterator for it, that's how we iterate over it one of the ways we iterate over it. I want to make sure my point is clear. You have, when you look at this code, you have no knowledge of what the underlying container is. You, you can't look at that code and go like, oh, it's an array. Oh, there's a link structure. Oh, there's some other funny container I'm not aware of. You have no idea. But it doesn't matter. Because if the iterator exists, you can iterate over that collection with that code, regardless of the underlying container. So the actual container doesn't matter. The iterator immediately removes having to know about what the underlying container is. Because it provides a common way to iterate. Is that clear? OK, we're going to stop here. And I think if it wasn't clear, it will become more clear when we Look, I've barely started this topic. So it will become more clear when we actually learn more about it.